We are pleased to present a second selection from the films made by a young American, Richard D. Kemp, whose father was a diplomat posted to the United States Embassy in Dublin in the early 1950s. In the first programme produced from Richard's films, From Baltimore to Belfast, Volume 8 in this series, we focused mainly on the railways of the south and west of Ireland. This time round, we are concentrating on both broad and narrow gauge lines in the north and west of the country. We begin at Amiens Street Station in Dublin, the southern terminus of the Great Northern Railway's main line from Belfast. Richard Kem spent the afternoon of the 12th of April, 1952, recording activity at the station. VS Class 440, number 208 Ligon, at the head of the 12 noon express from Belfast, arrives in Dublin. On the CIE lines to the west of the terminal platforms, T5 Class 440, number 546, passes with the 9.20 a.m. from Westport. Trains from the former Midland Great Western routes had worked through to terminate at Westland Row since the closure of their own station at the Broadstone in 1937. Back on the GNR side, Railcar G leaves with a 3.20 p.m. local service to Balbriggan. A set of Great Northern AEC railcars form the 3.30 departure to Hoth. T2 class 442 tank number one was the station pilot that afternoon at Amiens Street. The 335 train from Westland Road to Galway passes through behind Woolwich Mogul number 377. No two coaches in the set seem to be of the same design. The 335 served both the Galway and Sligo lines, the train being normally divided at Mullingar. On this occasion it was run as two separate services. D5 class 440 number 347 follows the Galway service with the Sligo portion of the train. Steam locomotives as well as diesel rail cars were used on GNR local services in the Dublin area. T2 tank number 65 leaves at the 4.20 p.m. service to Donabate. For a short time in the early 1950s, the Belfast to Dublin Enterprise Express was extended to Cork. B2 class 460, number 407, approaches Amiens Street with the 115 departure from Cork, which will be worked forward to Belfast by a GNR locomotive. Railcar G returns from its trip to Balbriggan. Number 65 makes another appearance, returning from Donabate. Richard Kem's afternoon visit to Amiens Street all those years ago has left us with a wonderful record of what was then the routine everyday activity at the GNR's Dublin station. This wonderful sequence ends in an appropriately impressive fashion with VS Class 440 number 208 Ligon leaving Amiens Street with the 530 Enterprise Express for Belfast. We head up the Great Northern Main Line to Drogheda. VS Class 440 number 207, Boyne, brings an express from Dublin into the station. The junction to the right of the train is that of the branch to Navan and Oldcastle, along which we will make a brief diversion. At Navan, 442 tank number 2 runs round the single coach which has formed the 355 service from Drogheda. Later, QG class 060 number 155 arrives at Navan with the 4pm train from Oldcastle. Back at Drogheda, 
one of the versatile SG3 class 060s number 97 leaves with the 340 stopping passenger train to Dublin. At the other end of Drogheda station, an unidentified S-Class 440 heads north with the 245 Dublin to Dundalk train. What looks like a Q-Class 440 heads an up train round a short curve leading off the Boyne viaduct at the north end of Drogheda station. The original viaduct over the River Boyne, which opened in 1853, carried double track. When it was extensively reconstructed by the GNR in the 1930s to accommodate heavier locomotives, space for only one set of rails could be provided. It remains to this day one of the most impressive feats of civil engineering on the Irish railway network. We continue our journey northwards to Dundalk, where south of the station was Dundalk Square Crossing, where the Dundalk, Newry and Grenoble Railway crossed the GNR main line on the level. On the Dublin side of the Square Crossing was the GNR's Dundalk Works. VS Class 440 number 210, Ern, passes the works with the Cork to Belfast Enterprise. On 30th of August 1953, S-Class 440 number 173, Galtee Moor, moves the empty coaching stock out of the sidings at Dundalk Station, which will form the 1030 service to Belfast. In the summer timetable of that year, this train ran as a stopping service 15 minutes after the departure of the 9am Dublin to Belfast Express, which did not stop between Dundalk and Belfast. That morning, V-Class compound to 440 number 83, Eagle, powered the Express. Having crossed the border into Northern Ireland, the first stop for mainline expresses was at Gora Wood. This was the junction for the lines to Warren Point and Armagh. The GNR's ballast quarry was located here beside the station. Most trains stopped at Gora Wood for examination by customs officials. In August 1953, S-Class number 173, Galtee Moor, pilots V-Class number 83, Eagle, on the heavy 11-coach, 12-noon train from Belfast to Dublin. Rail cars on a Belfast to Dublin service pass under the overbridge, carrying the line to Armagh, which closed to passengers in 1933. The rail cars are followed by a Belfast to Warren Point train, which includes two former Dundalk, Newry and Gnor six-wheel carriages in its formation. This rake was later recorded leaving Warren Point. The Dundalk, Newry and Gnor railway, which closed on the 1st of January 1952, was an Irish offshoot of the mighty London and Northwestern Railway. Its carriages were painted in LNWR livery, not used in England since the grouping in 1923, right up to the line's closure. These were the last six-wheel carriages in regular service on the Great Northern. Rare colour footage of this line may be seen in Volume 5 in this series, Irish Railways in the 1940s and 50s. The 442 tank number 116, still in charge, the set arrives back at Warren Point later in the day. 
We continue northwards again on the GNR main line. QL class 440 number 115 arrives at Scarva, junction for the branch to Banbridge. The 5.35 p.m. train from Belfast to Warren Point. Making a connection with this service is Railcar A, which had left Banbridge at 5 past 6, taking 20 minutes to travel the 6.5 miles to Scarva. Passenger services on the line from Lockmore Junction, south of Lisburn, to Banbridge and Newcastle, and on the branch from Banbridge to Scarva, were withdrawn in 1955 and 1956. We are pleased to be able to feature these lines for the first time in this series, in these all too brief scenes of a rail bus and rail cars at Banbridge Station. A much more familiar location is Lisburn. Rail cars 612 and 613 leave the station for Belfast on the 150 service from Antrim. U class 440 number 204 Antrim arrives at Lisburn with a stopping train from Belfast. Rail cars 608 and 609 speed through without stopping on the 245 service from Belfast to Dublin. QL class 440 number 156 follows the Dublin train at the 3 p.m. from Belfast to Cavan, a journey which will take three and three quarter hours to complete. Schoolboys run to catch a stopping train for Belfast, which is also our destination. Rail cars arrive at the GNR's Great Victoria Street station in Belfast. We will return to the GNR later in the programme, but we have another railway to explore. The former LMS NCC terminus at York Road in Belfast has featured in several programmes in this series, though none of our footage has been as early as these scenes filmed in 1952. One of the diesel shunters built for the NCC by Harland and Wolfe is seen. 264 tank number one arrives at York Road with the train from Larne. When the NCC lines were nationalised in 1948, the newly created Ulster Transport Authority inherited the most modern steam fleet in the whole country. Number 19 was one of two LMS Jinties, regaged to 5 foot 3 and sent to Ulster during the Second World War. The other main component of the NCC steam fleet were the 15 W-class moguls, built between 1933 and 1942. Number 94, the main, arrives with a train from Port Rish. 264 tank, number 52, leaves York Road with a train for Whitehead. W class number 100, Queen Elizabeth, heads the 240 train to Port Rush in Londonderry, which will be divided at Coleraine. Number 100 is equipped with one of the high-sided Stanier design tenders, which looked much better than the smaller filo style ones such as that seen paired with number 93, the foil, in the next sequence. As that locomotive backs down onto the stock of the 11.25am Belfast to Londonderry train. Richard Kem travelled on the service behind number 93 and filmed the train leaving Ballymena. we encounter a type of locomotive not previously featured in this series. U2 class 440 number 83, this near Castle, shunts some bread vans at the station. Mughal number 104, one of three which were never given names, brings the 1105 train from Londonderry into Coleraine. Derry is our next stop. Our exploration of the narrow gauge in the northwest begins at the Pennyburn Shed of the Londonderry and Luxwilly Railway Company. By 1952, the Swilly was on its last legs as a railway operator. Passenger services had ended, and only goods trains were running on the two sections which were still open, the lines to Brincrana and Letterkenny. 460 tank number two 
seen shunting at the Swiddy's Graving Dock Terminus in Derry. This was one of four engines built by Andrew Barclay in 1902 for the opening of the grandly named Letterkenny and Burtonport Extension Railway. Unique colour footage dating from the 1930s featuring this remarkable line is published in Volume 3 of this series, which is devoted to the Irish Narra Gage. The first four miles of the Swilly system were in Northern Ireland, but the rest of it was in County Donegal. This meant delays for customs examinations. At Bridge End, Irish customs officials inspected trains. Number two is shunting wagons there in August 1952. Two tank number 10 leaves Fawn with the goods for Brincrana. Number 10 was one of a pair of locomotives built by Kerr Stewart in 1904. The locomotive was later seen shunting its train at Brincrana. Swilly goods trains usually conveyed a brake coach to accommodate the guard. On the way back to Derry, the train is recorded again at Fawn. Interestingly, a County Donegal Railway's buggy wagon, converted from a passenger coach, is included in the formation. Most Swilly stock could not run coupled to CDR vehicles because the two companies had different buffer heights. A goods train leaves Bridge End bound for Derry. Again, note the brake coach marshalled at the end of the formation. As we shall see later, goods trains on the County Donegal Norgage lines also had a brake coach at the rear to accommodate the guard. We are back at Bridge End again, this time to explore the other part of the Swilly system which was still open, the line to Letterkenny. This parted from the Brincrana line at Tuban Junction, six miles out of Derry. The locomotive shunting the Letterkenny goods at Bridge End on the 21st of August 1952 is 462 tank number 8, one of a pair built by Hudswell Clark in 1901. The large buggy van number 89 heading the wagons being loose shunted past the camera was one of three built for the fish traffic on the Burtonport line. The amount of shunting which was required to marshal this short goods train, all brought about by the need to have the wagons examined by customs officials, demonstrates vividly how much delay and disruption was caused by the border. The one beneficial side effect on this occasion was that it allowed Richard Cam time to reload his camera with colour film. The external appearance of the locomotive is immaculate. The 1040 goods from Letterkenny to Londonderry arrives at Newton Cunningham, headed by 460 tank number two. Once this is in the loop, the signal drops to give the Letterkenny bound train the road. Number eight runs round at Letterkenny at the Loxwilly station, which was beside that of the County Donegal Railways. At the CDR station, 264 tank number 2 Blanche is about to depart with the 1247 goods to Strapan, providing a splendid introduction to County Donegal's other Norrigage system. At the other end of this branch, which opened as late as 1909, the same locomotive hauls a goods bound for Letterkenny. 
The bridge in the background, across the headwaters of the River Foyle, takes the line from County Tyrone into County Donegal and from Northern Ireland into the Irish Republic. Across the river at Straban Station, where the CDR met the GNR main line from Belfast to Derry, wheelcar number 20 leaves on the 235 service to Letterkenny. Most passenger services on the CDR were operated by rail cars, which could haul a trailer or a van or two to increase their passenger and parcels capacity. Here, rail car number 16 arrives at Straban with the service from Letterkenny. We are travelling up the Finn Valley line from Straban. Rail car number 14 approaches Castle Finn. Its trailer began life as a petrol engine rail car on the broad gauge Dublin and Blessington steam tramway. Regaged by the CDR, it later lost its engine, but was used as an unpowered trailer until closure. It was then preserved and can be seen today at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum at Coltraw outside Belfast. CDR was busy with goods traffic throughout the 1950s. Class 5264 tank number 5 Drumbo, a shunting Aston order, which was both the site of the railway's workshops and its administrative offices. Class 5264 tank number 3 Lydia is making up a goods for Donegal Town. Drumbo heads her goods bound for Straban out of Stranorder. This locomotive survived the closure of the system and is now in the care of the County Donegal Railway Restoration Society and will in time be restored to running order at their base at the Heritage Centre into which the derelict Donegal Town Station has been transformed by the society. Back at Stranorder Station, rail car number 16 shunts in the works yard. A rail car leaves for Straban, towing one of the red painted vans, lighter than normal goods wagons, which usually accompanied the rail cars. The last of the Donegal rail cars was number 20, which was built in 1951. Still at work on the Isle of Man Railway, she demonstrates the haulage capacity of the rail cars, bringing the exceptional load of a trailer, a coach and a couple of vans into Stranorder on a service for Donegal Town. Crossing point between Stranorder and Donegal Town was at Loch Esk. This had been the terminus of the Donegal Railway from 1882 until 1889, until sufficient funds were raised to extend the line to Donegal Town. Number five, Drumbo brings Achilles bags to Straban goods through the station and the loop. In its glory days as the temporary terminus of the railway, this location was called Drominin. But after 1889, it took its more familiar name from the nearby loch. The railway had passed through a starkly contrasting landscape in the last few miles. From the bleak summit of Barnsmore Gap, where it was over 590 feet above sea level, to the rolling green hills around Loch Esk. How unobtrusive is the railway in the landscape? Number three, Lydia, brings the 1110 Stranorder to Donegal Goods, which we saw the locomotive forming earlier at Stranorder, into Loch Esk. Lydia was one of the last three steam locomotives acquired by the CDR, built by Naismith Wilson in Manchester in 1912. The passing loop at Loch Esk was to the east of the station. Wheel car number 18, now restored to working order on the Foyle Valley Railway in Derry, arrives with the 1120 Straban to Killybeg service. When passenger trains were required to cross at the station, the procedure was to hold the Donegal train in the loop, allowing the Stranorder bound working to complete its station duties. When this had passed through the loop and was on its way, the points and signals were changed and the other train could run up to the platform, which was behind the camera. 
We move on to Donegal Town, where the main line from Straban continued on to Kelly Beggs and there was a branch to Ballyshannon. Real car number 16 is leaving Donegal Town, bound for Kelly Beggs. Number 5, Drumbo, is shunting a goods train in the station. This locomotive now resides not 100 yards from where these scenes were recorded, though the County Donegal Railway Restoration Society has much work to do to her before she can steam again. Wheelcar number 18 leaves Donegal Town, bound for Killy Beggs. The real cars could stop at level crossings to pick up and set down passengers, as number 20 is doing here at a set of gates near Inver, roughly halfway between Donegal Town and Killy Beggs. A goods from Killy Beggs to Sonora crosses Inver Bridge. The locomotive in charge is once again number five, Drumbo. Wheelcar 18 leaves Killy Beggs on a working to Straban. On its return journey from Killy Beggs, Wheelcar 20 pauses at those gates near Inver to pick up our cameraman. Number 16 arrives back at Donegal Town from Killy Beggs, giving us just time for a brief look at the other CDR line from Donegal, the branch to Ballyshannon, which opened in 1905. Real car number 16 approaches Ballyshannon station with a working from Donegal Town. The coupling rods of its power unit clank noisily over the points as it enters the station. The Donegal rail cars could only be driven from one end and had to be turned at each terminus. But that was a small price to pay for the contribution which these economical and flexible units made to the working of the railway. It is no exaggeration to say that the use of these vehicles helped prolong the life of the CDR until the end of the 1950s. From the famous Norwegian railways of County Donegal, we moved to the adjacent county of Tyrone to revisit perhaps the most singular branch line operating the whole of the British Isles in the 1950s. When the London Dairy and Enniskillen Railway was building its line, Construction halted temporarily in 1853 due to shortage of funds at the little village of Fintana. When work resumed on extending the line to Enniskillen the next year, it was decided to do this from what became Fintana Junction and not from the 1853 terminus in the village. Left with a branch three quarters of a mile long from the junction to the village, the company got approval from the Board of Trade to work the line with horsepower. This remained the case for the next 103 years, until the line was closed. The branch was justly famous for its unique mode of power, which was latterly a gelding called Dick. The tram itself offered three classes of accommodation when these were available on connecting mainline trains. Third class passengers were banished to the open top deck, whilst the bottom saloon was divided into second and first class sections. When the tram arrived at Fintan Junction, the horse was put in a stable beside the signal box. On one occasion he had been scared by a steam locomotive blowing off, had bolted and damaged the tram. The horse was usually brought out and hooked up to the tram when the connecting services had departed. The 
tram was painted in the blue and cream livery which its owners, the Great Northern, also applied to its rail cars and road buses. The spaces between the sleepers along the line were filled in with ash to make life easier for the horse. Steam locomotives did venture down the branch to deal with the goods traffic. At Finsna, there was another stable for the horse at the station. On the closure of the line, Dick went into honourable retirement and the tram was preserved. A happy ending for both parties. From Fintna, we travelled the 20 odd miles southwest to Inniskillen, the county town of Fermanagh, and an important station on the GNR's cross border network of secondary lines, which extended from Dundalk on the east coast to Bindoran on the west. All of these lines were swept away in the closures of 1957, when the Government of Northern Ireland withdrew its support for services on these lines. The fragments which remained in the Republic were unsustainable without the connections through Northern Ireland leaving CIE with no option but to go along with these unwarranted closures, which left a gaping hole in the railway map of Ireland. Richard Kem had come to Inniskillen to record another unique Irish railway institution, one which was brought down by the destruction of the GNR lines in 1957. This was Ireland's last independent broad gauge company, the Sligo Leitrim and Northern Counties Railway, whose line ran from Inniskillen to Sligo. The SLNCR really was a remarkable concern. Its fleet of 064 tank locomotives were known by the names they carried. They had no numbers. Its traffic was dominated by the carriage of cattle, and most of its passenger services were operated by rail car and rail buses. An SLNCR rail bus reverses out of its bay platform at Inniskillen, its distinctive luggage trailer behind it. Railcar B, acquired in 1947, was unique. It was the only broad gauge railcar built by Walker Brothers, who had been providing such vehicles for the County Donegal narrow gauge lines since the 1930s. <laughs> We join Richard Kem in the cab of this rail car as it crosses Weir's Bridge, just outside Inniskillen, at the start of the 48 mile run to Sligo. Manor Hamilton, roughly halfway between the two termini, was the line's headquarters and the location of its workshops. Rail car B leaves the station with the midday working from Inniskillen to Sligo. Railbus 2A passes Manor Hamilton station level crossing with the next service to Sligo which had left Inniskillen at 2pm. The same railbus gathers speed as it leaves Manor Hamilton. These vehicles were literally road buses on flanged rail wheels. They may have looked incongruous but they were a very economical alternative to steam locomotives when it came to providing a passenger service on a lightly used line such as the SLNCR. 064 tank, Loch Melvin, arrives with the 2.30pm goods from Inniskillen. Most of the locomotives bought by the SLNCR over the years were of this wheel arrangement, one not greatly favoured elsewhere. Loch Melvin and sister loco Loch Ern were the last of these, being built by Bayer Peacock as late as 1949. Real Car B returns from Sligo on the 4pm service to Inniskillen and crosses the goods at Manor Hamilton. The Real Car resumes its journey to Inniskillen. Once the passenger service is out of the way, the heavy goods train resumes its journey to Sligo.
Our final view of the SLNCR is of a rail bus and its trailer at Sligo Station. We will stay in County Sligo for our next sequence. A J19 class 060 arrives at Kiltamock on the line from Colony to Clermorris with a ballast train. Clermorris, 10 miles to the south, was and still is an important junction. A former Midland Great Western 240 takes the 1.30pm service from Westport to Dublin out of the station. J15 number 123, seen at Clemorris station, was a locomotive rostered on the Ballon Road branch that day. CIE's newly delivered AEC rail cars, similar to those introduced by the GNR in 1948 and seen earlier in this programme, were being tested on the lines to the west in 1952. Rail cars number 2616 and 2617 are inspected at Clemorris before heading off back east. A much more familiar sight here in 1952 would have been the train of cattle wagons which is arriving at the station. The movement of cattle was always an important source of traffic on the lines of the former Midland Great Western Railway. This formation includes some open top wagons providing little comfort for the unfortunate beasts which had to travel in them. One of the wagons has an opening canvas cover in the middle of its roof. This was a distinctively Irish design of wagon seen all over the country for most of the preceding 100 years. From an important Midland Junction station in the west, we moved to another one, Mullingar, some 80 miles to the east of Clermorris. Here a former Midland 060 number 610 is shunting the Sligo portion of the 3.35pm train from Dublin Westland Road to Galway and Sligo. It may be recalled that this train was featured in the opening sequence of this programme at Amiens Street Station in Dublin. On that occasion the train was running in two portions. Here, as was usually the case, it is being divided at Mullingar. The carriages for Galway leave Mullingar headed by Woolwich Muggle number 379. At Athlone Midland Station, another pair of the new rail cars, which, as we shall see later, will soon be challenging steam traction on the lines to the west, are observed. To end this all too brief excursion down the former Midland Great Western main line, we have a view of an ex-Midland 060 tank, number 552, shunting at Galway Station. Back at Mullingar, the Sligo portion of the 335 from Dublin is ready to depart behind a Midland 240. We jump forward now from the previous sequence to 1957 in terms of time, and nearly 60 years in terms of railway technology, as A-class diesel A6 leaves Drummond with a train for Sligo. In the 1950s and happily once again in the 1990s, Drummond is the place to alight if you are interested in the Irish narrow gauge. Richard Kemp visited and filmed the Cavan and Leitrim narrow gauge system in both 1952 and 1957. On the second occasion he was using colour film. The footage taken on both visits has been edited together for this programme. The journey begins at the southern end of the railway with number three, one of the original 440 tanks built for the opening of the line in 1887, 
shunting at Mohill. Number three was working the 1220 Drummond to Belturbet, the only through northbound train along the whole length of the railway. As with all CNL passenger trains, it was mixed. The lengthy delays to attach and detach wagons and intermediate stations like Mohill made travel on this service a leisurely business. It took over three hours for a train to cover the 33 miles from Drummond to Belturbet. Number three arrives at Balnamore, the headquarters of the line on the junction of the branch to Arigna. The main running shed was at Balnamore, as were the workshops, though since the line was amalgamated into the Great Southern Railways in 1925, most of the major work on locomotives was carried out at Inch Co Works in Dublin. The Arigna train is pulled out of its bay platform to collect some wagons. The reason for the line's survival until 1959 was that it served one of Ireland's few workable coal deposits found near Arigna. The traffic from the mines could be very intense at times. Several locomotives from closed three-foot gauge lines were transferred to Balnamore by the Great Southern and CIE to cope with the coal traffic. Number four, seen here, was a 260 tank supplied to the Tralee and Dingle line in 1903 and sent north by the GSR in 1941. Number three was another ex Tralee and Dingle engine sent to the CNL at the same time as number four. The Arigna branch was a roadside tramway for much of its length. The train pauses at the roadside halt of Corner Brown. The mines were at Doreen Navogi beyond Arigna. Coal was mined high up on a ridge and brought down to the railway on an aerial ropeway. The line up to the mines was opened as late as 1920 as part of an attempt to stimulate Irish coal production during the Great War. The passenger service, such as it was, terminated at Rigna Station, about one and a half miles from the mines. The coach and brake van would be joined by a rake of loaded coal wagons for the run back to Balnamore. In the 1950s, there was only one daily return working, conveying passengers on the tramway to Rigna. Train bound for Balnamore is seen here near Drumshanbo, hauled by the former Tralee and Dingle locomotive. Number three. On Richard Kemp's 1957 visit, the train from Drummond was hauled by one of the former Cork Black Rock and Passage 242 tanks, which had been sent to Balnamore by the Great Southern in the 1930s, when their own line had closed. Coal traffic was so heavy in 1957 that another Trulli and Dingle locomotive, 260 tank number 6, had been overhauled at Inchicore and sent to the line earlier that year. The one daily train north of Balnamore pauses for a spot of shunting at Ballyconnell, about five miles from the line's northern terminus. The locomotive is one of the original Cavan and Leitrim 440 tanks built by Robert Stevenson and Sons in Tyneside in the 1880s. When the line closed, this locomotive was purchased for preservation in the United States of America. Just outside Belturbet station, the railway crossed the River Erne on a fine four-arched stone viaduct, the most impressive engineering feature of the line. At Belturbet, where the Cavan and Leitrim shared a station with the Great Northern Railway, number three runs round its train. There were exchange sidings with the broad gauge here. Nora gauge wagons which had been brought to Belturbet have to be positioned for unloading or for their contents to be transferred into Great Northern wagons for onward transit.
there was a convenient platform on a shed providing some protection from the weather for the exchange of goods between the two gauges at Belturbet. A broad gauge track is on the right of this goods platform. With the impetuosity of youth, our filmmaker climbed the water tank to get a good view of the engine turning and lived to tell the tale. Local service and station duties completed, number three is almost ready to return to Balinamore. The connecting Great Northern services on the branch from Belturbet to Ballyhays on the Calvin de Clonas line were often in the hands of the charming little JT 242 tanks, which dated from the turn of the century. The locals used on the Belturbet branch were based at Clona Shed, seen in the background. Part of the charm of these GNR lines was the variety of motive power used on them, from Victorian 440s to modern diesel rail cars. 1957 was the year the lines through Clonas lost their passenger services. By this time, dieselisation had been making big strides on the main lines of CIE. Kilcock is about 20 miles out of Dublin on the former Midland Great Western main line. Though it lost its passenger services in 1947, a new station is being opened in 1999 to cater for the growing suburban traffic into Dublin on this line. It will be recalled that on our previous views of trains to the west at Amiens Street in Dublin and Mullingar, steam traction was supreme. By 1957, the main line trains were being hauled by the new A-class diesels in their striking silver livery with diesel rail cars operating some services. Even that traffic which was so long a staple of the Midland, the cattle train, was in the hands of the A-Class. This was the sort of train which had rumbled up and down this line since it had opened. Now this traffic is entrusted to the brand new A39 and her sisters, and not a steam locomotive. Some steam engines were still to be seen. An ex Midland 060 was at Kilcock on a pickup goods. But steam had clearly been marginalised on the CIE network in a very short space of time. Kingsbridge Station in the summer of 1953. A 440 leaves with a short passenger train and is replaced by a pair of rail cars, which will form a service to Waterford via Port Leisha and Kilkenny. The rail cars pass through the main line station at the Curra. They arrive at Kildare, where a 440 is shunting the stock of a local train. The rail cars leave Kilkenny to continue their journey to Waterford. Richard Kem has disembarked at Kilkenny with a group of other railway enthusiasts for a trip up the branch to Castle Comer. This was one of the last broad gauge lines to be built in the country. It opened in 1921 to serve coal mines near Castle Comer. Like the extension to the Arigna branch of the Cavan and Leitrim, it was financed by British government money in a belated attempt to stimulate Irish coal production during the Great War. The line lost its passenger services in 1931, only ten years after it had opened. Courage has been added to the branch goods 
to facilitate the enthusiasts. The locomotive is J15A class 060, number 702. One of the few locomotives built in the days of the Great Southern. The locomotive takes water at Castle Comer. On arrival back at Kilkenny, the wagons of coal the train has brought down from the mines are taken off to the yard. A 4 for gets the road for the return journey to Dublin via Athai. For our final sequence, we return to Dublin where we started, but to another location and one new to this series, Glasnevin Junction in the north of the city. Rail cars from first Sligo and then Galway are near the end of their long journeys. A heavy goods train from the north wall struggles up the gradient hauled by a Woolwich Muggle and banked by one of the former Midland J5 class 060s known to railwaymen as the cattle engines. An indication of how important this traffic was to that company. A 400 class 460 heads for Amiens Street to take the Enterprise Express on to Cork. A short locomotive coal train comes up from the yards at the north wall. This is the spring of 1953 and the Enterprise would continue to run through to Cork for another few months. After which the sight of GNR coaches at locations like Glasnevin Junction would once again be rare indeed. The 2.40 p.m. train to Westport is formed of rail cars. The 3.35 to Galway and Sligo has already made two appearances in this programme, on both occasions in 1952 hauled by steam locomotives. Now in 1953 the working has been taken over by rail cars and was running as two separate trains, the Galway train preceding that bound for Sligo. The other train which has run like a thread through both this volume and the previous one in the series is the Cork, Dublin and Belfast Enterprise. It seems appropriate that we should end with this train as it passes through Glasnevin on its way to the north, hauled by one of the three magnificent 800 class locomotives, the largest ever to run in Ireland. A fitting way to draw the shutters on the wonderful window on the railways of Ireland in the 1950s, which Richard Kem's films has opened for us. <laughs>